Can you hear me? Oh, wow, that's good. Can I have the slides? Well, it's a real pleasure to be here, and uh, I want to start with a couple of thank yous because um, Art's going to have to come up and wrestle me off the stage at the, <laughs> the end, most likely. Um, but it, but uh, this is the real Nobel Prize winner here, the nematode C. elegans, six Nobel Prizes, uh, you know, for a whole bunch of interesting different things. And um, it's been just a great organism to work on. And uh, there's still so much more that we can learn from this tiny little animal. And uh, I won't say too much more about it. This is the group. I'm going to talk a little bit about some work from Masaki and mainly Me Too here. Uh, but it's a great group. And uh, it's a great time to be here talking to you guys. Of course, it's a very exciting time in, in this whole field. Um, if I could have the lights just a little bit lower, it'd be great. Um, if not, what you see here is the germline of C. elegans in this beautiful movie made by uh, Wolk et al. in Jim Priest's lab. And what you can see here in green are mitochondria. And what you're looking at uh, surrounding the nuclei there are these beautiful enigmatic liquid drops that uh, essentially decorate the outsides of germline nuclei, not only in C. elegans, but also in many other organisms. And uh, I just love this movie because it's so dynamic and you can see all this flow going on. Um, and uh, one of the things that I love about it is how you can see the mitochondria filling the eggs in the ovary here. And you can see these beautiful perinuclear structures also uh, getting stripped off and deposited into the eggs. And I remember showing this to my mom when I was um, back in grad school, like, I don't know, <laughs> over 30 years ago. And my mom took, she's an artist, and she took one look at these cool things, and she s says, Craig, what are those? You should work on those. Those are going to be important. And, uh, you know, beauty in science, I think that's what really motivates us. But I think there's, uh, you know, there's often this tie between the creative uh, impulse for art and science. And I, I just really value sharing things like, like these beautiful images with people who are not scientists. And my mom has just been great that way. Anyway, she told me I should work on those. And lo and behold, I'll be talking a lot about them. <clears throat> But first, I want to just talk about the flow of information in the history of time. What got, what got me really interested in science was when I was a kid in high school, and I read in the Washington Post that the human insulin gene had been cloned into bacterial cells, and the bacterial cells could read the human genetic code and make functional insulin for diabetic patients. And I thought to myself, that's amazing and incredibly powerful, but I knew about evolution because my dad was a paleontologist and I had grown up going to the Smithsonian and stuff. I just couldn't conceive of the idea that after billions of years of, uh, of evolution, the genetic information that we have can be read by a bacterial cell. And so I, I've always been interested in that and I've, um, been pursuing it uh, pretty much throughout my scientific career. What you see here is a timeline for the history of the Earth, basically with the formation of the Earth back here and the present day over here. And uh, this I've depicted, this is sort of my interpretation of the likely scenario for the flow of information. I imagine an RNA world where a lot of sort of molecular organisms got together to form the first cells. So you have essentially this horizontal gathering of information from all these independently evolved lineages to make the first cells uh, more than uh, three billion years ago. Genetic code was arose sometime uh, way back then. Of course, key components of cellular information decoding, such as ribosomes and all of that, are incredibly ancient. Um, and then, uh, you know, no one knows for sure how this worked out, but you have this division uh, somewhere early in the history of life into various uh, single cellular uh, organisms. And of course, 
at this event here, this is the, um, essentially they call it the oxygen catastrophe. This is the evolution of oxygenic photosynthesis in cyanobacteria. This is two and a half billion years ago. That's a really long time. And what these guys did is they started releasing oxygen uh, by splitting water and they nearly froze the earth. They caused a snowball earth event that lasted 100 million years. The other thing I want to point out, and, and this, I, this is, I do think this is relevant, I just want to point this out over here. This is the Cambrian explosion over here. Most of the history of the earth, there is nothing on land. No plants, no animals. The earth is probably inhospitable to large organisms for mo like three and a half billion years of the history of life. And yet we know that there were incredibly sophisticated organisms uh, alive, especially in this time. And again, information uh, flows between these organisms horizontally. They transfer genetic information to each other. And the most extreme examples of this are the fusion of independent organisms into a single organism. And this has happened repeatedly in the history of, of life. And of course, the most famous example are the mitochondria and the chloroplasts. I showed you some of the mitochondria in the first uh, slide where these former microbes inhabit the cytoplasm of the cell. But what's remarkable is this symbiosis occurs through an engulfment and then essentially the acquisition of the entire genome from another organism. So talk about gene transfer. This stuff, this is ancient. Cells have been doing this for billions of years. Incredibly amazing that you can have this melding of genetic information uh, and still have a successful organism. And of course, it happened repeatedly. So I would argue, uh, especially these eukaryotes that live below the ice, uh, below the Cambrian, were incredibly, are incredibly sophisticated organisms and that they're masters of handling information transfer. Um, and um, as ancient as these events are, the mechanisms that we work on involved in the handling of information, the argonauts and the CRISPRs and things like that, these are also incredibly ancient mechanisms. And I would argue that they are incredibly important in the history of life because when you acquire information horizontally, it's of course very potentially very dangerous. So organisms have to have mechanisms to manage acquired information. But the beauty of a silencing mechanism, especially one like the Argonaut system, is that you can acquire information, silence it, and then maintain it in the genome as, as sort of, you know, potential, uh, potentially useful information for later on. So they get to keep the information and they silence it. And then you have the transposons, of course. They have their, their own little selfish elements. But in the ecosystem of the genome, they also provide this activity of being able to rearrange genetic information. I would argue, and this is just me, I don't think I can prove it, but I would argue that the genome organization, which lo looks so enigmatic to us, is in fact a essentially a digestive system, if you will, for information. Most of what you see there is not information that's in use, it's information that is in the process of being either digested away or potentially redeployed. And just think about the mitochondrial genome acquisition. This is truly amazing. Thousands of genes redeployed from the nuclear genome that process must have taken literally millions and millions of years to essentially wire the genome to express uh, those gene products successfully. I think it's truly fascinating. Um, <clears throat> and of course, in addition to this ability to acquire new information, the genome is optimized for um, creating variation through meiotic recombination, the genome is intentionally fragmented 
uh, during every uh, life cycle uh, to enhance variation. And then uh, this Mendelian segregation mechanism, chromosome segregation, just so beautiful, allows a very rapid fixation of variants that could potentially be adaptive. So truly, tr I mean, I can't say enough, these organisms, these tiny ancient organisms that gave rise to all of the big land animals that we've seen since the Cambrian, they were already doing all of this. They were already super sophisticated. And I would also argue that there are a whole bunch of other genomic mechanisms that we still totally don't understand that ensure, for example, a robust supply of things like the rDNA, the tRNAs, um, histones, and a whole variety of other important machinery uh, at a much higher fidelity um, than a lot of the genome which is involved in adaptive, um, essentially rapid adaptive evolution. Uh, anyway, it's, I, I just, I'm in awe of the complexity of the information handling abilities of organisms. And you guys are all trying to understand, I mean we all are, myself included, how, how does it work and how can we take advantage of that to improve human health? And I would argue that we have a great deal more to learn about the basic mechanisms. That's just a picture of what the earth looked like 500, well that says 640 million years ago, but that's below the Cambrian, so nothing on land. Now, just one last cute little movie here. These are single-celled animals. So this is sort of what I imagine life was like underneath that ice. So of course, these are modern um, organisms. Uh, these are ciliates. And uh, this is a single-celled animal, just truly amazing. You can see it's basically vacuuming up bacteria here. And the point is, it's a single cell. And so um, when it acquires food, in inevitably, the genomic material from whatever it's eating is in the cytoplasm along with the nucleus. It's really not a stretch to imagine how you could get that, aver you know, that original uh, insertion of the genomic material from, from something like a precursor of a mitochondria. Just for uh, comparison, this is a metazoan, which uh, I would, you know, it's, it's clearly a, a you know, an interesting multicellular organism, a rotifer. It's got, instead of one cell, th about a thousand cells. And um, it just looks really dull and plodding alongside of these amazing single-celled animals. I, I just, again, want to emphasize that I think all of us are guilty of underestimating the sophistication of living things. They are truly sophisticated, and there is no such thing as a higher or lower organisms, so try to get that out of your lexicon. Everything alive today is a survivor of close to four billion years of evolution. So, you know, people really do like, uh, sim you know, to simplify, and we tend to really oversimplify. So, you know, back in 2002, there was a lot of hype about um, RNA interference and the idea that a double-stranded RNA could silence gene expression. I just want to show you what ran on uh, CBS News to remind you in case you missed this important piece of news here. Looks very official. Here's the double-stranded RNA. Now watch carefully. Pretty, pretty amazing, huh? A little bit of an oversimplification. I don't know if any of you have figured out how to make RNA do that yet. Um, probably somebody in one of the posters has it figured out. Um, so we were, we were kind of up against a problem because um, in 1998, Andrew Fire and I published this paper saying that double-stranded RNA could trigger gene silencing. And, you know, it was very exciting, uh, but I tell you, when we submitted that paper to Nature, it had zero information on mechanism. The CBS News model was not our model, but, you know, at least it was equally plausible to just about any other model that was out there. 
Um, so we were very nervous when we first submitted that paper um, because we had no mechanism, we had no evidence that it was conserved even. <clears throat> um, so in 1999, uh, we identified the first gene, uh, RDE1. We molecularly cloned it. We had, while uh, the paper was in review at Nature, we had already started a genetic screen. So by 1999, we'd cloned the first gene and we published it. Um, and uh, it was clear right away from the genetics that the story was much more complicated, that double-stranded RNA was not the only type of trigger for these kinds of gene silencing mechanisms. And this, this is the model from the paper. What we had basically shown was that a couple of genes that we found uh, were required for the double-stranded RNA response. And interestingly, a bunch of other genes that were involved in this double-stranded RNA response were also required to silence the transposons and to silence um, genes when we introduce them, transgenes. So clearly, when you put a transgene into an organism, it triggers something related to RNA interference, but we argued in our paper that it was genetically distinct and therefore probably had a distinct triggering mechanism. Rather, the DNA that we're introducing is not directly eliciting a double-stranded RNA response. And uh, this almost got our paper rejected uh, because it was too complicated. Um, but, but luckily, we cloned the RDE1 gene. Uh, while the paper was in review, we, we got the molecular identity of the gene, and it turned out to be a highly conserved gene. So we knew that there was another mechanism for initiating silencing. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit more in my talk today. So here's where we were in 1999. We cloned this gene, RDE1. And of course, genomics was just heating up back in 1999. So we were able to compare the sequence of RDE1 to the sequence of other organisms and, of course, to the entire uh, C. elegans genome. And we could look at the entire Argonaut gene family, the RDE1 Argonaut gene family. Um, and this, of course, was, you know, especially since we were looking for another pathway, we, have fig we figured maybe RDE1 is involved in the double-stranded RNA response and some other homolog of RDE1 is employed in the transposon response and who knows. So maybe we can find those other genes by knocking out members of the RDE1 gene family. I'll just point out that as you can see over here, there's four human genes that are closely related to a couple of C. elegans genes, um, ALG1 and ALG2. And then there's four more human genes over here that are closely related to uh, two worm genes, PRG1 and PRG2. These are the peewee argonauts. Um, and then there's a whole bunch of argonauts in C. elegans. It has a family of 12 closely related argonauts that have been expanded. And so we had a lot of work. I mean, this, this literally took us the next like 15 years to do all the genetics and we're still analyzing the phenotypes and genetics for uh, a lot of these C. elegans genes, but luckily we could knock genes out in the worm and we could do reverse genetics to uh, try to figure out um, which, if any, of these other genes were involved in an RNA uh, transposon silencing mechanism. Um, and interestingly, these two genes, when we knocked them out, gave us a lethal phenotype and it was very similar to the phenotype of a couple of genes that had been identified by Victor Ambrose and Gary Rovkin other C. elegans researchers who discovered the first microRNAs, and it turned out that this, these genes were involved in a microRNA pathway um, in the worm where the worm would express foldback RNA that would be processed uh, very much like exogenous double-stranded RNA gets processed by Dicer and so on to um, regulate gene expression. That was very exciting too, and I think that's what prompted uh, the CBS uh, segment is actually this combination of uh, conservation of microRNA function and mechanism over, um, you know, the time since the divergence of all animals. Incredible. Anyway, so uh, we continued our explor exploration since those weren't involved, and I'll tell you a little bit more about this gene and this gene uh, and some of these genes in the course of our, my talk, because it turns out all of these are involved in um, transposon silencing. So. 
<coughs> this is a crystal, an old structure from Dinshaw and Patel now of Argonaut. And of course, what this is, is it's Google for the cell. It's a search engine that allows the cell to use short search queries to find and regulate targets inside the cell. Here you can see the DNA, I mean the RNA inside the Argonaut. Um, the guide strand here is in red. And uh, you can see how beautifully it can base pair inside the structure of the protein. And by pairing, especially in this region, it places the, the target strand in proximity to a catalytic center. So this is a nuclease that can find and then cleave target RNA uh, very efficiently and very catalytically. So uh, incredible. And uh, I don't know why this comes up again. Oh yeah, because if you're a bad speller, there's an Argonaut, there are versions of these Argonauts that tolerate mismatches, which is I think incredibly clever of living things to realize that by relaxing the sequence complementarity a little bit, they can expand the repertoire of their guide sequences. Of course, microRNAs are genomically encoded, so even with just a few hundred microRNAs, you can achieve quite a diversity of regulation because they allow mismatches. It's just like me when I try to spell something and I can't spell it right, my um, spell checker can fix it for me, thank goodness. Um, anyway, so here's what I'm going to talk about a little bit uh, in the next few slides. Um, so, Caesar 1 is shown here in these beautiful, this is what my mom said I should work on, remember, uh, these beautiful halo of uh, perinuclear uh, structures. In fact, not only is Caesar 1 localized there, but if you mutate Caesar 1, these uh, beautiful perinuclear structures uh, aggregate in the cytoplasm. They don't even localize properly uh, to the nuclear periphery. Um, Wago, Wago 1, for example, some of the other Wagos as well, also localize in these same structures. This is a Wago 1 GFP. And PRG1, which is the Peewee Argonaut I showed you that was on the left-hand side of that, that earlier um, Argonaut slide, uh, localizes also in these same perinuclear structures. And what I'm going to tell you I don't have the animation there, but what I'm going to tell you is that this Argonaut is involved in recognizing self. This, they're part, these are part of an oligonucleotide-guided immune system, and as in any kind of immunity, self-distinction is extremely important. And so what we hypothesize Caesar 1 is doing is recognizing self-transcripts so that they, it, they can be protected from these other mechanisms. This Argonaut is, is scanning, and it's scanning uh, using genomically encoded small RNAs, like microRNAs, only instead of a few hundred, there's tens of thousands, and in humans, probably millions of these uh, small RNAs that are genomically encoded, produced by PAL2 polymerase. And these are loaded onto the peewee Argonaut and carry out a scanning function and if they find a foreign sequence that's not protected by Caesar 1, they initiate recruitment of an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase that then uh, loads this Argonaut. So anyway, here's just a reminder of how the worm, the worm is like amazingly good at RNAi. I mean, you can just feed them double-stranded RNA and they will initiate silencing extremely robustly. Um, which is amazing, but the reason they can do it is they have these RNA-dependent RNA polymerases that um, humans don't have. Uh, they can essentially amplify this up, upstream part of the pathway. This is the part of the pathway that's common in um, practically all eukaryotes. So you have a dicer, double-stranded RNA gets processed, and loaded onto RDE1. RD1 carries out a search. The, the two strands, of course, separate, that, and it doesn't, it doesn't chew up the targets. Uh, you get strand separation, and then you get a search. Uh, if it finds a target, it is cleavage competent, but it also recruits this RDRP. The RDRP then loads what, the secondary Argonauts called the Wago, the Wago, expanded group of Wago Argonauts. And then these, in turn, can also recruit RDRP. 
So they provide a memory function. Once they're initiated, they can then propagate silencing um, and they can actually do it uh, transgenerationally from one generation to the next. And they work with, we think, another nuclease, RDE8, which helps in target RNA destruction. So, of course, how does this work? Now, one of the first sort of amazing and bizarre features that we noticed when, when we and others were sequencing the small RNAs from C. elegans is that by far the majority of the naturally occurring small RNA species in the animal are perfectly complementary to mRNAs. And in fact, essentially every mRNA expressed in the germline, which is about 80% of the genes, has antisense small RNAs that coat the coding region all the way from the UTR to the ATG. Um, you can even deduce the splicing by just reading the antisense small RNAs for the genomic. Uh, you can basically infer splicing from it. They're so abundant. So this was really a mystery until we did the IP. So with the Caesar one IP, we discovered that these self-directed small RNAs are, are complex with this Argonaut Caesar one And the, the ones that are targeting transposons and, uh, you know, when we initiate RNAi as well, uh, those small RNAs are, are complexed with uh, the Wago Argonauts, Wago one and others. And amazingly, these Argonauts are, are present in the gametes, in the mature gametes, so Caesar one and Wago are, are both extremely abundant in both the sperm and the egg. And you saw those little red foci that were stripping off the nuclei and being deposited in the egg. If I showed you spermatogenesis, you would see that around the sperm nucleus, there's a, a halo of RNA that is full, and it's full of these argonauts, tons of argonaut uh, and small RNA in the sperm. So they send uh, these RNA memories, if you will, of previous gene expression and previous silencing are getting transmitted in the, in the germline. So <clears throat> that was fascinating, but we had no real good way of studying the functions of all of those argonauts. We needed, we needed better tools, and it's kind of ironic. We were, we were using transgenesis, you know, introducing DNA into the animal, um, for years and years, and we knew that silencing was a big problem. We knew that genes would get silenced and that the silencing machinery was somehow related. I told you it was not dependent on RDE1, but it was nevertheless related to the RNA interference mechanism because many of the other genes required for RNAi were defective. Um, but we were using this method. Uh, finally, someone, uh, Eric Jorgensen's lab, developed a way of, of you know, putting genes back by homologous recombination into, into a defined location. And so using this method, we could sort of control for, for, you know, the spatial question of whether or not there's some sort of influence of surrounding sequences. And we were introducing these transgenes in, uh, using this method. And we noticed um, that many times the genes were uh, inactive. I'll say inactive because we didn't know they were silenced. They were so inactive that it didn't seem like silencing even, they were just dead. And then Masaki, just, he was experimenting with one gene in particular, and he noticed something very odd. It was expressed initially, and then it would, be, then it would turn off, but it would stay on in the somatic tissues, but it would be completely off in the germline. And so he got curious about it, and he did a very, this is just an example, so sometimes he could get this gene to be on initially uh, and it would just ultimately be completely silent or dead, uh, ultimately. And so he did a really uh, simple, oh, I'll come to that in a moment. And like I said, it was interesting phenomenology. So here's t two versions of the same GFP fusion, except the GFP's at the N terminus here and the C terminus here. This one is always silent, no matter what we do, if we introduce that transgene, 100% of the strains end up silencing it. This one is always active. So when we introduce that one, uh, we get active lines all the time. Weird. 
phenomenology. We still don't exactly know why that is. I could wave my arms and speculate. But Mazaki did this very simple experiment. He took one of those silent lines and he crossed it to one of these active lines. And this is what he got. The silencing was dominant. So that told us that not only was it silencing, but it was transitive in nature, that it was capable of influencing the expression of a, a gene with a sequence identity um, and, and turn it off. And, and moreover, you could then segregate this line away from this one and it would stay in the off state. Really cool. So, um, and I won't tell you the whole story of, of the genetics, but it turned out to be related to uh, an RNA interference mechanism, and it depends on uh, this gene, PRG1. Interestingly, if you take a silent transgene and you cross it into the PRG1 mutant, it stays silent. But if you take this, one of these transgenes that always goes silent, and you de novo introduce the transgene into a PRG1 mutant, it's always active. So that was our clue that PRG1 is involved at an upstream step in the recognition of a foreign uh, gene. And so, you know, here's the pathway for double-stranded RNA, and this is what we think is happening for transgenes. So when you introduce a transgene, and I'm just showing you a representative example of uh, the peewee uh, pi RNAs, we call them. These are, uh, these are basically encoded in the genome, and there's a huge cluster of them on chromosome 4. And there are protein coding genes on chromosome 4 inside the pi RNA cluster. The pi RNA genes reside in the middle and throughout this whole region. Um, and there's, it's actually the most abundant uh, type of Paul II gene in the entire uh, C. elegans genome. And they're fascinating little guys, uh, and I think there's another real interesting mystery going on as to how this gene family is maintained and expanded along chromosome 4, but I won't go into that. So these, fun these function with Peewee, and they tolerate mismatches, they scan mRNAs, and then they recruit RDRP. Once they initiate silencing, this loop uh, maintains the silencing, and as I said, since these are in the germline, this is inherited, and it's very, very stable. So the silent state can be transmitted indefinitely in the germline. It's truly fascinating biology. So, like I said, here's peewee for the worm, and there's, of course, there's four human peewee genes. There's three peewee genes in the mouse, and all three mouse peewee knockouts are completely sterile. So they're doing something important in the germline, and in fact, it's clear from uh, sort of one arm of the human peewee system is uh, dedicated to transposon silencing. That's completely clear. But there's another uh, sort of unexplored arm of the peewee pathway that engages uh, something analogous to the worm pi RNAs. They're genomically encoded in the human genome, um, and there's, like I said, millions of them that are encoded but don't target transposons, and what they do uh, is still sort of a, up in the air. And this is how the worm pi RNAs are made. The pi RNAs have a promoter element about eight nucleotides long. They have a 40 nucleotide spacer between the promoter element and the start of transcription. And interestingly, Paul II, when it transcribes a pi RNA gene, seems to pause or terminate early, producing nothing but a short RNA, and that RNA gets uh, decapped and then trimmed to produce this mature uh, pi RNA. And it, of course, it has to have a U at the five prime end, so we call them 21 U's. These, these are probably either not made or unstable when they are made because we detect the precursors being formed uh, quite often that don't have a, a U at the first, at the third position. See, they have to take this, uh, this and two nucleotides off. Anyway, that's got to be a U. Lots of weird, interesting biology going on there. Anyway, so I told you that you could introduce a transgene into the peewee mutant background, and it would be on when normally it would always be off. And if you then cross it into wild type, it will uh, often go silent, although that's another story. Um, so the problem, of course, is that with something like, you know, upwards of 20 or 30,000 different guide RNAs, 
Peewee is competent because of its ability to use mismatched pairing, it's going to target everything. So how can this immune system work? You know, it doesn't make any sense. In fact, we thought about this idea and dismissed it many, many times <laughs> because it just didn't seem like it could work. Um, now, hundreds of pyRNAs can target GFP, and th these are some examples. You can find these pyRNAs that match up with the GFP sequence. I'm showing the exons of GFP here in green. And here's uh, an example. There's really good seed matching in some, this one in particular. And then you can often see uh, that they induce uh, RDRP synthesis at this beginning at this, uh, there's a C in the, in the transcript that becomes the first nucleotide of an RDRP product. The RDRPs always initiate trans, um, transcription with a G. So we call these products of RDRPs 22 Gs, and you can see that this 22 G species is extremely abundant, and it's right inside of a 21 U. And now, this isn't my work, but my, uh, my former postdoc went ahead and did the obvious thing and mutated uh, some of these sequences in GFP so that they could no longer be targeted, and he's made GFPs that are very resistant to silencing that way, which is uh, sort of a confirmation that this targeting is important. But how do the pyRNAs avoid targeting the self transcripts? And we still don't really know how that is, but you know, this was the obvious solution because Caesar one seems to be engaged with antisense RNAs that essentially reflect a memory of previous germline gene expression. And as fantastic and incomprehensible as it seems that this animal can transmit a memory of previous gene expression and use that to modulate the targeting of this guy, that's what we proposed. And we wanted a way to test that. And uh, in the course of some crosses in genetics, we came across a transgene that had a very interesting property. So we could take this transgene and do one of Masaki's crosses and instead of getting silencing, we got desilencing. So that gave us an opportunity because one way to sort of rationalize this is to think that perhaps this strain has acquired somehow licensed or you know, acquired GFP as a seizure target, for example. And so we went ahead and cloned the RNAs from line B and sure enough, now GFP small RNAs are present in the Caesar complex. And moreover, we could do a cross, uh, and I don't know if I, sh yeah, so the cross is here. So we took this transgene that's expressed in the cytoplasm, you can see it back here, and we crossed it to GFP CDK. This is the one that always goes silent and conveniently it's a nuclear protein. So you can see that when you cross these two together, you get this beautiful nuclear signal. Um, and so, me too, Seth did this very nice experiment. She took a animal. It turns out Caesar one is completely sterile as a homozygote, but the heterozygotes are viable. So she was able to take a heterozygote and do this cross. And interestingly, you can see the OMA GFP, this is the activating allele, uh, is nicely expressed here. And when she crosses it with this, it does not activate. She's, it stays silent, so the target gene, this GFP-CDK1, uh, does not get activated when she does a cross using a Caesar one mutant heterozygote background. So that implies that Caesar one is, in fact, required for this desilencing, this transitive desilencing. I won't go too much more into the genetics of that. But the, this gives us some uh, evidence that supports this idea that Caesar one is protecting self-mRNAs from uh, silencing. And I love this system. It's, it's, it's remarkable. It's very complicated, but it's truly remarkable because by remembering self, the animal is able to recognize foreign sequences by their sequence content. It doesn't have to rely on the, you know, virus conveniently exposing a double-stranded RNA to the cytoplasm or something. It can actually look at the sequence itself and then decide, aha, I've never seen that sequence before. I'm going to silence that. 
So I just want to give you a little bit of an overview of how this may be working. So we have this sort of competing pathways. We have Caesar one that's recognizing self genes and the self part of the transcript is shown here in blue. And then we've attached a sequence from jellyfish that the worm has of course never seen. And then there's some sort of a competition presumably between the peewee pathway and the Caesar pathway. The Caesar pathway can also spread because it recruits RDRP. We don't know the rules and exactly how it does that, but we assume it can spread uh, adjacent to where it's targeting and recruit RDRP. And so there's a battle that goes on and you can get all these different outcomes. And I showed you a couple of extreme examples where transgenes are either always on or always off, but you get all, a lot of intermediates where transgenes are on half the time, they, they're on for generations, then they go off. I mean, lots of different possibilities. Here's, here's a couple of the examples. So in this one, the transgene gets licensed, it's, it stays on, and uh, Caesar one presumably is protecting it from silencing. In this example, uh, PRG1 wins, Wagos get recruited, and the gene is off. Now, if you cross them together, it depends on the degree to which this protective mechanism is at work, presumably, and you can get this kind of genetic interaction where this one can trans-silence the other one. We call that RNA-induced epigenetic silencing. And you can have this opposite effect, this RNA activation, or RNA-A, where this transgene can activate. Um, in trans. So that's all pretty <laughs> incredibly complicated and strange, fascinating biology. Um, we have probably years of work to do to understand the mechanisms of all of that. Um, but another thing that's pretty amazing is that you can have a balanced, um, you can have a transgene that's on and another one that's off. And this uh, is something I'll just give a few slides about. Oh. It's all, every aspect of the small RNA silencing is played out at the chromatin level as well. So there's a tight linkage between small RNAs and chromatin that's incredibly ancient, uh, present in the common ancestors of animals, plants, and fungi, really remarkable. So here's an example of a balanced uh, silencing. In this case, there are two transgenes present. One of them's on, you can see the OMA GFP is on, and this other transgene is in a silent state, and it's the two remain stably. They're in the, they're, ex, they're both expressed in the same region, in the same cells even, um, but in this sort of balanced state, one stays on stably and the other one stays off stably. Um, if you knock out PRG1 in this strain, now the Caesar 1 GFP uh, comes on beautifully, and you can see this perinuclear halos of Caesar one staining. So that was really interesting, and it gave me to an opportunity to do a screen that was very convenient where she could find components of both of these pathways. I won't talk about that today. But one of the things that she did, uh, along with uh, Heng Chi Lee, a postdoc in the lab, is uh, they respecified a pi RNA to target GFP. And then they introduced this new pi RNA gene into uh, this OMA GFP strain where this resistant uh, Caesar one protected um, GFP is expressed. And what they saw was that they got this very, this is, you can barely see the Caesar 22 Gs that are uh, at, in the background here uh, when there's no uh, pi RNA. This, is, this strain here, this trace, is showing small RNAs that have been isolated from the strain that now expresses a pi RNA that's perfectly complementary to GFP. Um, and you can see that you get this beautiful induction at the first C in the target, directly under the pi RNA of 22 Gs. And yet this transgene stays on. Um, but interestingly, the transgene stays on, but its level is now reduced. So she's getting stable partial silencing. And it's transmitted now with the mRNA being expressed at a lower level. mRNA is lower, mRNA is lower, protein is also lower. So interestingly, pi RNAs can achieve a partial, a stable partial knockdown. And um, I'll just quickly show this last couple of slides. This is kind of interesting, trying to track down what it is about this OMA sequence that makes it special. Uh, Masaki and Me Too did a whole bunch of uh, swaps. So they took the CDK1 promoter 
and UTR, and they attached it to this OMA gene. And uh, this is still able to do, um, the, the OMA gene is able to do transactivation even when it's got the CDK1 promoter and 3' UTR. So it's something about the middle part here. And conversely, CDK1 or GFP CDK1 can't, uh, it's still silenced even when it has the promoter and 3' UTR. So this is something about the body of the gene itself. And if they take away all the introns from this part of the gene, uh, indeed, again, this is able to transactivate. This is still, uh, this, oh, yeah. And then they, then she did something where she intentionally altered the, the OMA sequence as much as possible, but changed the codon so that it could still encode the same protein. And now this one becomes completely silent. So it's, and then in addition, just to be sure, she frame shifted the OMA1 open reading frame and she filled in 11 stop codons. So the sequence is almost identical to OMA1, but it can encode any kind of a OMA protein. So it's not the protein coding potential of the gene that's making this gene resistant. It's something about the sequence, because even this plus frame, plus one frame, even though it's not expressed, it's probably a very non-optimal um, open reading frame, uh, nevertheless is able to transactivate another uh, transgene. And I'm running low on time, so I'll just end with one more thing. And interestingly, you can put stop codons into a gene, a transgene that can do RNA-A or RNA-E, and it doesn't matter. It's still able to transactivate or transsilence. Again, arguing that the coding potential is not important and that the um, surveillance mechanism that detects or transmits these silencing and activation signals occurs probably upstream of this nonsense mediated decay mechanism, which is thought to be co-translational. And so here's kind of a last slide snapshot of what we think might be happening. These beautiful perinuclear structures assemble around the nuclear periphery. They've been shown by EM to be sitting over nuclear pores. Transcripts as they emerge are marked in some way that presumably um, reflects their, um, the chromatin environment in which they're transcribed. You know, there's a lot of evidence for that kind of thing. These are perhaps both positive and negative signals, but in, in a case here you have an mRNA coming out and it's gonna get scanned by these two different mechanisms. And uh, it can be uh, silenced, it can be partially silenced, and of course it can be uh, expressed. And, one attractive idea is that this uh, liquid drop environment has been shown uh, to be, appears to exclude ribosomes. So you could imagine that this allows argonauts an opportunity to look at the open reading frame before the ribosomes get on board. And uh, so there's a whole potential new window of gene regulation that's sort of dedicated to Argonaut surveillance of transcripts in the germline, and it's positioned uh, right over the nuclear pore so that you can take a look at what you're transcribing before you let ribosomes get on it. So that's kind of a, a cool concept, and I'll end with that. I think there's just a, so much more we have to learn um, about the incredible, ancient, incredibly ancient mechanisms that are at work in organizing our germline and controlling the flow of information from uh, one organism to the other, and of course from one parent to offspring. Uh, I think we'll all be busy for a very long time. And I just wanna thank everybody for your attention. Thank you. I'm happy to take questions. We have. Hi. Uh, but then you're showing uh, that it's got the promoter stopping the deposit. Is it the same link between that particular protein? Oh, no, there, there's, I, I'm sorry, I probably shouldn't have. Lynn's question was about promoter proximal pausing and the silencing machinery. That's a great question. There may be something like that going on, but I didn't mean to imply that that's what we think. What we know is that the pyRNA genes um, seemingly are just making these short transcripts. So for some reason, we don't know why, the pyRNA is when they're transcribed to make a short capped RNA. 
and that gets processed into a pi RNA. And I didn't allude to it, I think it was on that slide. It turns out, and, I, and, and this is really fascinating, all the germline genes, like per, literally all of them, also have these short capped RNAs that are often made bidirectionally at all their promoters. And um, so this is just part of gene expression in the germline, maybe in all tissues, I don't know, but certainly in the germline, we detect short capped RNAs being made adjacent to the promoters in both direction for all the Paul II genes. Those are also loaded onto the Pee Wee Argonaut. And the biology of that, you, you know, it's anybody's guess. Does it do anything or does it just happen because they happen to be the right size and the machinery can do it? We don't know. But we don't have any evidence that there's a feedback of the argonaut onto the, the polymerase and the promoter, although that would be fascinating and I think not even unlikely. So it would be really cool if that's happening, but we don't have any evidence for that. Uh, here, uh, two quick questions. One, going back to the origin of your concept of RNA world. Uh, do you think that RNA as we see it now was for billion dollars, uh, for billion years back in the same form, which is connected via three prime, five prime phosphodiester links. And the second question is about RNA dependent, RNA polymerase amplification of RNA. Uh, do you think we're getting the same length of RNA back, i.e. if it's 21 nucleotide long, we're, or 23 or whatever number it is, we're getting 23 back? Because obviously, five prime or three prime terminal nucleotides cannot be replicated the same way, with the same fidelity at least, as they enter into the complex with RNA dependent RNA polymerase. I don't think I understood the last question. Um, unfortunately, oligonucleotides don't have a great fossil record, so it's hard to answer the first question, too. Probably it was not in its current form uh, back then. I think if you, if you talk to the people who do sort of RNA world related sort of uh, chemistry and science, it, it, it's probably not uh, that simple. Um, and I, I totally, you can ask me later about the second question, I didn't quite understand it. RNA dependent RNA polymerase, you have a duplex. Yes. And the second strand of RNA should be replicated by RNA polymerase. So obviously, the terminal nucleotide cannot be recognized and reproduced with the fidelity. So you're getting something either longer or shorter. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think it is uh, messed up there at that point. The, the question is about the RDRP mechanism. The RDRP is clearly using the mRNA as a template. It doesn't have an end problem. We don't, you know, it initiates, we don't know how it initiates, but it seems to initiate de novo at the, the first C that it encounters in the, in the target mRNA. So it somehow recognizes the first C. And we know that we, we um, assume that it's de novo synthesis uh, beginning at that because it's, these are triphosphorylated small RNAs. They have a th triphosphate on their 5 prime end. So it looks like they're, you know, they're just made by RDRP by incorporating a G as the first nucleotide. And then the end of the, what, you know, what terminates the RDRP uh, and determines the three prime end, we don't know, but the transcript presumably is all there. So again, there's no end problem. The transcript can provide a template function without an end problem for that polymerase, I think. And the, the, the 22 Gs that are made by RDRP are, are pretty robust in numbers. They're very easy to detect. Last question and then we'll have to go to the you mentioned the transgeneration effect, which is very prominent for C. elegans, like, and you mentioned the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. Could you specify, is that the main key regulator for allowing this transgeneration effect in C. elegans? You said forever or 14 generations have been published, and would that have implications for us? I mean, we have a little bit of transgeneration for a few generations, sure. two or three. I would like your comment. Sure. Uh, the, the epigenetic aspect is fascinating, the fact that you can transmit these um, small RNAs uh, stably from one generation to the next. We, how many forever? I mean, we have no evidence that it's dying out after 
many generations. But um, humans don't have RDRP, so they probably are not transmitting small RNA signals like this. Um, however, uh, chromatin, like I said, is linked to the small RNA pathways in you know, all, all the places where it's been studied. It looks very, to me, like it would be very easy to imagine an epigenetic mechanism that uses chromatin to help transmit. But organisms, of course, you know, they can play with the uh, fidelity of, of these types of epigenetic mechanisms. I, I don't know how important it is in transgenerational inheritance, but clearly epigenetic programming is, is central, really, to the differentiation of cells in eukaryotes. And then clearly, you know, animals like us, you know, worms only live, you know, 14 days, but humans live years. And your cells, if they don't stay epigenetically programmed, you're in big trouble, <laughs> you know? But, but um, the worms, you know, are actually programming in their germline. I think it's, the biology of that is, is likely to share some common features at the chromatin regulation level. We haven't gone there yet. Okay, last, last question. Uh, so, Craig, uh, uh, when you discovered RNAi with Ender Fire, yeah, uh, it took a decade for actually for the field as a whole to develop a drug. And today we all have heard news from Al Nylum that Batizaran shows beautiful phase three data and very likely to become a drug. So today you have described two new mechanisms of RNA-based transcriptional regulation, like RNA-E and RNA-A. What is your predictions? What is the probability is that we would be, whether it's existing humans and whether it would be possible to make drugs employing this uh, basic biology? Well, you never know. That's why you have to do the basic biology um, in the first place, you know. And, and I think well, the way I would answer your question is I think in, in even thinking about, you know, the remarkable and very promising success of uh, oligonucleotides in the clinic right now. Um, you know, there's so much going on that we don't understand. You know, why do we get this very long duration of effect? If you had asked, I think, anybody in the field, would you expect a sub-Q injection to give you, you know, a six months duration of effect, they would have laughed at you, um, you know, anywhere in the past decade, right? But the fact that we do, uh, really stri strikes me as meaning that there's some really interesting biology there. And could there be, you know, who, who knows what the mechanism behind that is, but that's just one example. And I think that there's so much more to learn at the basic side uh, about how RNA flows systemically, for example. We have really very, even to date, very little understanding in C. elegans about how an ingested RNA can end up triggering silencing in the germline muscles, et cetera, nervous system of the animal. Truly amazing biology. Um, and my feeling is that, you know, in order to develop these therapies of the future, we need at least some people, you know, I'm happy to do it, uh, but we need a lot of people to keep working uh, on these little simple organisms, simple, I say, with a quotes, like bacteria or yeast or, um, are these rotifers or ciliates? You know, there's there's a treasure trove of information I think uh, waiting uh, there that's going to be applicable to this search for better and better um, therapeutics in the future. So that's my answer. Let's continue it over break. Thank you, Craig. Thank you.